Welcome to our panelists and to our audience for joining us live on this second day of the ASL annual meeting. My name's Emma Lindsay and I'm your moderator today. I'm a partner at Withers Worldwide in New York and the head of, the, of Withers International Arbitration and Public International Law Practice in the United States. Thanks to ASL and the annual meeting committee for convening this first virtual annual meeting and for the invitation to moderate this panel. Our panel today will address the duty to litigate in good faith in international dispute settlement. Thanks to Curtis Malay for sponsoring the panel. Let me briefly introduce our panelists whose work spans international dispute settlement in proceedings before the International Court of Justice, investor state arbitral tribunals, international human rights courts, and the World Trade Organization. Their accomplishments and accolades are legion, so I will just mention some aspects of their work that are most relevant for today's discussion. Payam Akavan is a professor of law at McGill University in Montreal and serves as counsel before international courts, including the ICJ and the European Court of Human Rights. Melida Hodgson is a partner at Jenner, Jenner and Block and head of the firm's international arbitration practice in New York. For this panel, I'll highlight her work as counsel in investor state arbitral proceedings and experience litigating WTO disputes. Campbell McLaughlin is a professor of law at the Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand and an arbitrator in investor state proceedings. He served as the rapporteur of the Institut de droit international's 18th Commission on Equality of the Parties before International Investment Tribunal. The resolution adopted last year is available among the materials for this session. Philippa Webb is a professor of public international law at King's College London and a barrister at 20 Essex Chambers in London. She's a specialist in relation to the ICJ. Our discussion will follow a rapid response format as promised for the session, but rather than speedy, I ask our panelists to be concise. I'm going to be strict on time so that we reserve some for the audience's questions at the end. To kick us off, I'll quickly mention three rather dramatic instances in which parties' adherence to the duty of good faith in international dispute settlement was called into question. Let's start with the alleged forgery of 82 diplomatic and other documents going to Qatar's claimed ownership of the Hawa Islands in the Qatar versus Bahrain case before the ICJ. Or another boundary delimitation case, their hard fought, the arbitration between Croatia and Slovenia in which one state appears to have wiretapped secret telephone conversations between an arbitrator and a representative of the other state, discussing how best to influence the other tribunal members and leaking the tribunal's deliberations. Then there's the campaign of sabotage against the arbitral proceedings by the state party in the Himperna versus Indonesia arbitration, which culminated in the abduction of an arbitrator from Amsterdam airport while on his way to The Hague but did not thwart the issuance of an award by the remaining two arbitrators. While these constitute dramatic instances of improper conduct in international proceedings, what of more run-of-the-mill guerrilla tactics? Failure to produce evidence, misrepresentation or distortion of arguments, or lack of candor to the court or tribunal? How should they be addressed? Speaking of the absence of common legal cultures in international arbitration, the late Johnny Vida said in his 2001 Goff lecture that it, I quote, does not mean that international practitioners are pirates sailing under no national flag. It only means that on the high seas, navigators need more than a coastal chart, end quote. Let's turn to our panelists to help us navigate the high seas. So turning to the, the roles of parties in council, my first question, I'll, I'll ask uh, Melida and, and Philippa to come in on this. How is a party to determine when conduct in a proceeding crosses from legitimate litigation strategy to unacceptable guerrilla tactics? As US Supreme Court Justice Stewart famously, famously said of obscenity, do we just know bad faith conduct when we see it? I invite the panelists to give examples from their own experience or knowledge, anonymized if necessary. Melida. Thank you, Emma, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me to be on this panel. So picking up on what you just said about uh, the Supreme Court justice, we, we all know a lie when we see it, right? We know the facts generally, and so we know a lie when we see it. And in international arbitration, and unfortunately in investment arbitration uh, sometimes, there are degrees of lies. And 
we or, or tribunals uh, seem to accept uh, that there can be a certain level of misrepresentation, uh, either, you know, sort of camouflaged as uh, strategy, as, as you put it, or as litigation style, drafting style. Um, I, you know, some examples that I've personally experienced is, uh, you know, in referencing what a party said, putting the statements in quotes, um, as if that is what the party said. Now, presumably the tribunal has actually read the other side's pleading, and so that doesn't become a critical issue, but it could be. Um, and so, and having a, for example, a brief that is replete with that kind of uh, drafting style or strategy. Um, uh, and, and then there are the intentionally false uh, statements that, you know, things that just are not true. Um, and, you know, that's, those kinds of things I think are fairly obvious. Um, it may be more difficult to, to discover, uh, you know, presenting uh, documents that aren't exactly right around at the time or withholding a document, but there's certain things that are just obvious, I would say. Well, for the part of the ICJ, a dubious conduct that can cross into bad faith can manifest itself on at least three levels, I think. So first, on the level of evidence, and this corresponds a lot with what Melida has pointed out. Um, on the one hand, we have notorious forgeries in the Qatar Bahrain case, as Emma mentioned. This include correspondence to or from people who were known to be dead or not yet born at the time of writing. But there can also be manipulation of evidence that's more nuanced. So selective production and non-disclosure, self-serving translations, mysterious disappearances of files from national archives. I've come across all of these in my practice. The second area is jurisdictional tactics. Now these may tread the line of aggressive strategy and bad faith. So you have a state accepting the ICJ's jurisdiction for the purpose of immediately bringing a dispute, or on the other side, a state formulating a reservation that is clearly directed at a broiling dispute. An applicant state may try to remove the basis of jurisdiction after instituting proceedings in order to insulate itself from counterclaims. And a state can and has terminated its acceptance of jurisdiction under a treaty on the very same day that it gets a provisional measures order that did not go its way. And the third area is the personal aspect. The international bar is small. On the one hand that militates against guerrilla tactics because we all know and respect each other and we could even be working for the same party in another case. But on the other hand, it's small size also risks pressures and indiscretions. So, so what are counsel to do in these in this circumstance? How how should counsel handle bad faith conduct, actual or potential, by their clients? How are counsel's duties to the client and the tribunal to be balanced? What if clashes in ethical obligations among counsel from juris different jurisdictions? Payam, I'd ask you to come into this, uh, and then and then Melida, you perhaps have to respond again. Um, thank you, Emma, and uh, thanks to the uh, American Society of International Law for including me on this panel. Um, the allegations of uh, bad faith, uh, including the clean hands uh, uh, doctrine, abuse of process, uh, are, have been frequently invoked in interstate proceedings, but international courts and tribunals rarely, if ever, seriously consider them. So um, much of uh, what goes into ensuring ethical conduct is self-regulation uh, by this um, uh, uh, Oscar Schachter's invisible college of lawyers, the small international bar that Professor Webb has, has spoken about. Um, and very often, I think one of the most convincing ways of speaking with clients is to let them know that um, the court will see through um, the bad behavior and, and that that will in fact prejudice the uh, interests uh, of the state. Uh, and more often than not, I think that this is part of a process of uh, acculturation and if you like socialization of, of governments into understanding the, the nature of the uh, ICJ and, and other institutions. 
Uh, so, you know, in, in the investor state context um, and, and also representing entities in, in state entities in commercial arbitration, I have to say I've not encountered this for the most part. Um, I have had uh, clients ask about following a certain strategy, procedural strategy that I, I didn't think uh, was correct or permitted. Um, and sometimes it does come from having a different domestic legal system, which perhaps permits you to go into court for every little thing that you want. And, and you, you know, it's not, it's not sanctioned. It's just our proceedings are different. And this is something of an education for, for some uh, clients. Um, I have had a client once say to me that, you know, I was more concerned about not upsetting the club than about furthering their interests. And I, I sort of said, well, I answered to a higher authority on, on those kinds of things. And, and uh, we agreed that a certain strategy would not be followed. I, I think in, in the instance may have been challenging uh, an arbitrator really for no reason um, or for reasons involved in a different case in reality. And so, you know, I think you, you at the end of the day, it's my reputation. And I, I think you have to make sure that you, you're not complicit in, in bad behavior by a client and, you know, subject to domestic professional um, requirements, bar requirements, then it may be painful if you get to that point, but I think you need to withdraw. Let's uh, perhaps switch to, to a judges and arbitrators perspective. How, how do judges and arbitrators approach, approach allegations of bad faith conduct during proceedings? What standard of proof is required? Which party bears the burden of proof? And Campbell, as an arbitrator, I'd ask you to come in on this uh, and, then, and then Philippa, you, you might respond. Well, thanks so, thanks so much, Emma, and uh, delighted to uh, be here at uh, uh, 5 a.m. New Zealand time, join uh, the American Society in this important discussion. Uh, I guess my view of uh, the principle of good faith is that it's really a correlative of the duties that the tribunal itself owes to the parties to treat them with equality and to accord due process. Because what this is, is the party's fundamental compact with the, each other and with the tribunal, um, which really stems from their consent to submit to the determination of their dispute to, to third party determination. And of course, the consequence of that is that it applies to both parties. I guess that's a statement of the obvious, but uh, it's important not to neglect uh, because, for example, uh, questions of good faith can and certainly do arise in the uh, investment context in terms of uh, applications, the submission to jurisdiction in the first place, whether the submission to jurisdiction by claimant has been uh, brought in good faith, uh, the duty not, therefore, to invoke jurisdiction abusively. Um, and it, of course, continues to apply throughout the proceedings to both parties, both not to obtain evidence unlawfully or to, in the case of the claimant, manipulate the corporate structure in a way that might avoid full disclosure, but then also in the case of the respondent, not to frustrate the process through use of its distinctive public power. So far as um, standard burden of proof is concerned, uh, I think burden follows the normal rule, which is the burden of proof rests on the applicant for relief, although the evidentiary burden may rest on the party asserting a particular fact or, or matter. But standard of proof is a different matter, and I think it's already been mentioned in discussion that um, allegations of bad faith are of a different character, a more serious character than many other allegations that can be made in the course of proceedings. Um, and it follows from that that the standard of proof is a bit higher um, so if I take the example of the relatively rare, but nevertheless, there are, there are reported examples of where it's alleged that a state has sought to misuse its criminal process powers uh, in order to obtain uh, an advantage in the arbitration. There, there has to be a higher threshold because of the nature of the uh, allegation, because the tribunal's function is not to sit in judgment upon criminal process in, or intervene in it in a general way, but merely to preserve its own powers to adjudicate the case that's put before it. What that means is that if an applicant's applying for provisional measures, for example, it's got to establish that it's actually being prevented from exercising its rights in the arbitration, which would cause it irreparable harm, and that there's no higher public interest uh, in pursuit of the criminal proceedings. 
and to support that by clear evidence uh, of conduct that's actually a, a, a aimed at obtaining an unfair advantage. So what in practice that means is that one needs to be able to point to concrete instances of coercion or harassment that might justify a plea of that kind. Thank you. Well, at the ICJ, as Payam pointed out, the doctrines of abusive process and abusive right have yet to succeed before the court. Um, we could call them Cinderella provisions that have not yet been given their opportunity to shine. But allegations of bad faith have been made by parties to five cases instituted in the last four years at the ICJ, Equatorial Guinea and France, certain Iranian assets, alleged violations of the Treaty of Amity, the Jadav case, and Qatar and UAE. Now, in ICJ terms, five cases in four years constitutes a major trend. These allegations include that a claim was brought in order to embroil the court in a broader strategic dispute between the two states, uh, that there were inconsistencies in correspondence adduced as evidence, that a party had failed to draw the court's attention to, quote, highly material facts, and that a party had failed to make genuine attempts to negotiate. Some of these allegations are still pending decision because the court has held that the abuse of rights doctrine cannot be invoked as a ground of admissibility and must be um, a matter for the merits. But in other cases, the court has refused to find these abuse claims made out. And the standard of proof is fairly high and it, it corresponds with some of what Campbell has mentioned uh, in the investor state context. So clear evidence is needed that conduct amounted to an abusive process. The court has said only exceptional circumstances warrant rejecting an applicant's claim on the ground of abusive process. And in relations to allegations that a state came to the court with unclean hands, the court has said, quote, even if it was shown that the applicant's conduct was not beyond reproach, this would not be sufficient per se to uphold the objection based on the unclean hands doctrine. I'm going to take us in, in perhaps a, a slightly different direction now, but one I think that it's important for us to address in light of the current circumstances in which we all find ourselves. And that is how does the increased use of technology affect the integrity of international proceedings? Um, I'm going to ask Campbell to address this and then, and then Payam, if you might come in as well. Yes, I think um, we've perhaps been used uh, for too long to the luxurious position of being able to convene in a forum and have the parties and all of their witnesses come to that place uh, so that we can hear evidence uh, live uh, before us. Uh, and maybe uh, in, in some instances, arbitrators have been a slower adopters of technology than even domestic courts, where it's now quite common uh, to give, uh, in some jurisdictions, uh, evidence by video. Seems to me in principle, the tribunal's approach should be the same. The main practical challenge uh, is the implications uh, of the use of technology to give witness testimony in order to ensure to preserve the integrity of the witness. Um, in other words, uh, to make sure that the witness's evidence can't be tampered with during the course of his or her um, testimony. Um, the approach that I've taken to date is simply to conclude a specific protocol with the parties in advance of the witness giving evidence, a, a written protocol, um, and so that everybody knows precisely what the specific rules of the game are in relation to uh, the giving of that uh, witness's evidence, even though uh, he or she uh, isn't directly in front of us. Thank you. Um, next Tuesday, the International Court of Justice will um, hold its first ever video hearing in uh, Guyana versus Venezuela. And um, uh, that's a, a remarkable step given the relatively conservative culture of the court. And of course, uh, we know as uh, advocates that oral pleadings are far less effective when one is not able to be physically present uh, in the room, there are all sorts of questions of uh, demeanor and, 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 and what have you. Um, having a full view uh, of the bench um, 
seeing which judge is awake and which judge is sleeping and all sorts of other advantages that come with being in the room. But I should add that in respect of the ICJ, it's quite rare to have witness testimony where um, physical presence is that much more uh, important. Uh, but in the context of um, cases involving human rights issues, uh, that su such testimony uh, tends to be far more uh, important. And even in the practice of the court, which very rarely has witness testimony, cases involving um, uh, human rights violations do call for, for such testimony. I, I saw that the, the changes to uh, the court's rules to accommodate the upcoming remote hearing were, were announced yesterday. Um, so this is obviously very, very timely in that context, I am. Um, turning then to, to the issue of, of sovereignty, um, and I'd ask all of you to come, come in on this, uh, perhaps starting, starting with Philippa. Um, how, how do judges and arbitrators account for sovereignty? Are states or should states be like any other litigant? So I think sovereignty should be taken into account, but in a limited manner. We can't ignore or avoid the reality that states are political entities with a powerful influence on international courts. They're not only potential parties, but they are able to establish new courts, wind up existing courts, set budgets, and elect or not re-elect judges. Sovereignty also brings with it notions of dignity and honor, and this promotes an attitude of deference towards states. Now, I believe at the jurisdictional phase, sovereignty should be carefully considered. Is there consent? And if so, what is its scope? But once a state has passed through the jurisdictional gateway, I don't believe that they should be given special treatment. Judges should take decisions to control the proceedings, ensure fairness and efficiency, and expose bad faith. In other courts, the African court, the Inter-American court, it lost the European courts, where states can and do appear against non-states parties, there is no preference given to them as states in those proceedings. I don't think this means that we should start encouraging the ICJ to throw counsel in prison for contempt but it can be exposure in a more genteel ICJ manner. So in the pulp mills on the River Uruguay case, the court observed that scientific and technical experts had been appearing as members of the council team rather than as witnesses. And this was a problem because as a result, they avoided being submitted to questioning by the other side and by the court. So the court noted in its judgment in a measured way that it, quote, would have found it more useful had the experts been presented by the parties as expert witnesses under Articles 57 and 64 of the Rules of Court. States took note of this gentle warning, and it has not been a significant problem in cases since then. So I think firm positions can be taken against states in a respectful tone. Payam, what's your view on this? I think uh, that one of the problems with interstate uh, proceedings, including um, human rights cases where fact finding is especially important, is the reluctance of the court to invoke um, Article 62 uh, of the Rules of Court, which provides that the court may call upon the parties to produce uh, evidence or to give explanations uh, to the court, or that the court itself may seek information for this a purpose. And of, of course, uh, there is also a possibility under paragraph two for the court to arrange for the attendance of a witness or expert to give evidence in the proceedings. And these powers have rarely, if ever, been uh, exercised by the court. And in cases which involve obligations, uh, erga omnes, uh, common interests, which are uh, distinguishable from purely bilateral uh, proceedings, um, I think it's very important for the, the court to exercise those powers uh, and to um, compel the production of evidence by the parties. And it will be interesting to see how some of these evidentiary issues unfold in um, the genocide convention case between the Gambia and Myanmar in the coming months.
Melida, let's, let's turn to you for your, your take on sovereign litigants. Right. So I, I would agree with Philippa that when in, in, in the investor state context that, uh, you know, one has to remember that investment treaties or FTAs that provide the right to bring claims under them, uh, it's a waiver of sovereign immunity. So one needs to start with the idea that there is a certain amount of immunity and that the sovereign is waiving that in a very limited context. Um, and so if the, I think it's important that tribunals take the, and I, and I don't mean to say that they don't, but that really under, that they understand that and take that quite seriously in the context of a jurisdictional um, uh, determination. I think we've seen changes, for example, uh, in, in we're about to have changes in the exit rules about when you uh, engage in a request that jurisdiction be determined, for example, on a bifurcated basis. In 2006, the rules were changed and the implication was that you did not have to um, sort of uh, engage in that, that determination, uh, that it was really sort of just discretionary. And, and, and what we saw was that there was movement towards not engaging in that. Uh, then you had some states come along and change provisions in their um, treaties and FTAs like the United States and basically say, you know, jurisdiction, you need to treat that as a, as a, as, as a gateway issue in that sense. And I think now the exit rules are going back um, to that. But once you get past that, I would also agree with, with Philippa that if you're talking about misconduct, then it should be treated equally. And yes, there are not many um, there's not a lot of guidance, perhaps, uh, and particularly in the investor state context. Yes, there are the IBA guidelines, uh, which talk about you know, false allegations or misleading evidence, um, but those are not specifically incorporated into the rules that operate in investor state in an investor state context. They have to be agreed to by the parties. Uh, ICSID is very specific about this, for example, when it looks at challenges that uh, those rules are not applicable. And indeed, the states that agreed to the convention did not adopt it and, and decide to agree to those rules. So that presents some issues. But again, I go back to the fact that some of this is fairly obvious. And frankly, if a state is engaging in that behavior, withholding documents, falsifying documents, whatever it is, and it should be treated as another party within that context. And, and my guess is that not a lot of states would say that they have a right to do that because of sovereignty. That sense, they're just another party and should be should be treated as another party. In that sense. Thank you, Campbell. I'll invite you to come in on this as well, please. Sure, and I I completely agree with Melida that uh, the basic starting premise here is that once jurisdiction is confirmed and we have a live proceeding, uh, the basic requirement on the tribunal is to treat the parties with equality. Uh, whether or not they're a state or, or a private uh, person. On the other hand, I, I don't for myself think that the requirement of equality means that we can fail to recognize the different uh, capacities that the two parties have, uh, because, uh, because what that leads to is different powers and responsibilities between a private investor on the one hand and a state who has an additional function or perhaps its critical function, which is to represent the public interest. So if we take the specific example of a plea of state secrecy from disclosure, which is a not uncommon uh, plea that uh, tribunals have to determine in the course of um, production of document applications, I think pretty clearly this gives rise to a set of issues which don't arise vis-a-vis -vis the private party. There may be other distinctive issues for the private party, such as uh, confidential business information and the like, but state secrecy has a particular uh, character which flows from the nature of the state uh, and its public role. Um, nevertheless, uh, it cannot be, become a self-judging blanket exclusion. Uh, the tribunal in that kind of context has a responsibility itself to try to balance the two public interests. One for the administration of justice, which uh, might lead point towards disclosure, and one uh, in the preservation of the confidentiality of government communications, uh, which might uh, point towards uh, recognizing a privilege in, in this context. Now, so long for myself, so long as that uh, process is itself conducted in a, in a judicial manner, that's not a, unlike 
uh, the um, kind of issues that are often have to be addressed by domestic um, uh, courts here in public law cases. It's still a subjection of the state to a fair judicial process, but it's one that recognizes um, nevertheless the state's um, distinctive character. Thank you. Let's turn now to, to responses by courts and tribunals to uh, allegations of bad faith conduct in proceedings. How do courts and tribunals combat bad behavior in proceedings? And we've heard um, some examples of the way that this is done with sort of gentle admonishments um, and other mechanisms. Um, but what are the range of options available to judges and arbitrators? And what responses actually get used in practice and how effective are they? Uh, Payam, would you like to take this one? And then Campbell, I'll ask you to come in. Uh, yes, well, I think that um, my experience in respect of human rights litigation before the uh, ICJ is that the court could be far more uh, assertive in this regard. And the case in point um, was the uh, request by uh, Bosnia in the Genocide Convention case uh, that began in 1993. Uh, uh, Bosnia requested unedited copies of documents containing minutes of the meetings of the Supreme Defense Council of uh, Serbia that were uh, directly relevant to the question of state responsibility uh, before the court. And uh, Vice President uh, al Hassane famously said that it is a reasonable expectation that those documents would have shed light on the central questions facing the court. And as I explained earlier, under the ICJ statute, um, uh, Article 62 of the Rules of Court, uh, 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 empowered the court to request those documents from Serbia. Uh, but what's remarkable is that uh, not only did the court not compel the production of those documents, but instead it criticized Bosnia, saying that Bosnia had extensive documentation and other evidence available to it, uh, including readily accessible ICTY uh, records. But of course, the um, volume of evidence and its probative value uh, are not the same thing. Uh, at the very least, the court could have done um, what it referred to in uh, the Corfu Channel case already in 1949, which is uh, at the very least to draw um, uh, adverse inferences from the failure uh, of a party to uh, produce that, that evidence. So I think that the court has a long way to go in being more uh, assertive in this regard. Well, let me just uh, add uh, some notes from my own experience. I think I think it's important to bear in mind that uh, a tribunal, an arbitral tribunal's concern is solely with the integrity of its own proceedings. It's, it's not uh, a global policeman. Uh, arbitral tribunals are not an international human rights court with a plenary jurisdiction to sit in judgment on the conduct uh, of the parties in other contexts nor so far as concerns the conduct of counsel, is it a disciplinary body? Um, and this means that it has to make, I think, careful use of its powers in order to ensure that it retains the confidence of the parties as well as the integrity of its proceedings. And that generally, as, as has been suggested uh, already um, in our discussions, um, a tribunal will tend to avoid making express findings of bad faith if, if it can achieve the objectives that it thinks it needs to, to preserve the integrity of the proceedings by other, by other means. Um, on the other hand, this, uh, the, the, um, the power to combat bad behavior and compel good faith is an important rationale for the tribunal's power to grant provisional measures. And here, I think there is a, a parallel, in fact, with the uh, practice of the international court um, in the Timor-Leste uh, case, uh, where precisely uh, uh, the uh, court uh, used its provisional measures power uh, in relation to uh, misconduct uh, of a state there. And the same applies in the in investor state arbitration uh, context. Uh, we, uh, tribunals should not hesitate to use their provisional measures power uh, when confronted with conduct which they are satisfied would otherwise uh, frustrate or not enable them to assure both parties um, uh, due, due process. 
Of course, the ultimate sanction of the provisional measures power, at least in the context of investor state arbitration, is really in the ultimate uh, power that the tribunal has at the end of the day to issue its award. We're all uh, are very much aware of the fact that uh, arbitra arbitral tribunals uh, lack, there's no court bailiff that can be sent out to compel uh, enforcement of a provisional measures order. On the other hand, tribunals uh, are vested by states uh, with a very significant uh, power to issue binding awards enforceable uh, under the exit convention. Thank you. So let's turn to the impact on proceedings of if allegations of bad faith conduct are not made out. Uh, how should courts and tribunals respond in these circumstances? And Melida, I'd ask you to come in on this uh, and then Philippa, please. Sure, and I think picking up on uh, something that Campbell has said, I, I think tribunals in the investment context are generally reluctant to um, uh, do more than sort of um, admonish uh, uh, litigants and, and parties. And, and as a matter of fact, uh, you know, the IBA guidelines do, do provide some guidance on that. One of the options is, is to admonish. Uh, another is uh, to include in Sort of address it in the apportionment of costs uh, at the end um, uh, I, and then another one would be to consider it within the context of uh, inferences that you make about evidence and obviously if it's an evidentiary issue that's the easier one i think to address i think when when you have a concern about sort of systematic guerrilla tactics or or just misrepresentation um, throughout a proceeding, uh, starting with um, any sort of preliminary filings that there may be, then you know, an inference is not something that's really going to address the problem. And I, I think that eventually tribunals will need to get to the point of uh, considering costs, maybe considering costs earlier than normal uh, or at an earlier stage of the proceeding. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, that has an impact, um, uh, whether it, whichever party it is, it, it has an impact. Um, you know, one of the issues that's come up, obviously, in, in investment arbitration is the impact of third party funders and whether or not third party funders make it easier for uh, certain uh, claimants to misbehave, essentially, because they've got lots of money to run up um, uh, against the other side, against the state. So. You know, all of these things, I think, lead to, to the conclusion that eventually, um, you know, mere admonishment uh, may, not, may not be enough. And we have to see tribunals getting to the point where um, they, they put something, money, behind that admonishment. I, I think, obviously, that's difficult uh, and within our, our sort of party-appointed arbitrator system. You, you don't want to get a reputation as being an arbitrator that's going to impose costs for bad, uh, essentially, counsel behavior because counsel are the ones that appoint arbitrators. And that, that is not to, to uh, uh, put any slight on arbitrators, but I think we're all human. And that you know, may be, for some, a factor that weighs against um, getting to the point of imposing uh, costs. But I think it is important within the larger context of legitimacy discussions that at some point, if that's a concern of states, you know, one of the larger concerns of, of states, then they will need to be, I think the best way to address it is on a case by case basis by the actors in, in the system, as opposed to having this be something else that's brought in uh, at a, a higher level um, by state parties in terms of imposing this in, in provisions. I, I think at any rate, there's some movement by some of the more, in some of the more recent agreements it may have been CETA, but one of, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the agreements uh, of the EU uh, to impose some sort of code of conduct that maybe goes beyond uh, just the arbitrators, which uh, people seem to be very interested in addressing arbitrator misconduct, but not uh, a lot addressing uh, party or, or uh, lawyer misconduct. But I think it has an impact on, on the legitimacy of the procedure. I think you've uh, 
I think perhaps addressed uh, sort of potential remedies, perhaps stronger remedies than, than we typically see, um, for instances of bad faith conduct wh where they occur, would be would you also apply those remedies, Melida, in the context of sort of allegations that don't end up being made out, which is a sort of another sort of, of bad faith conduct really in itself? Absolutely. I, I think in some ways that's more dangerous uh, because simply from a cost standpoint, the party, whichever side it is, has had to litigate those, those issues. And then at the end of the day, it's like, oh, well, you know, everybody makes bad faith allegations, so no harm done. And, and the fact of the matter is there is harm done. The harm is done by having to deal with it um, at the very least. And also I think that there's harm to the, to, to the proceeding and to the system uh, where you end up on tangents that aren't necessary. And, and at the end of the day, it's a false claim, <laughs> uh, if I can put it that way. And it ought to be dealt with. Well, in the ICJ context, when the ICJ finds allegations of bad faith are not made out, as it nearly always does, it simply declares there is no basis to conclude that Party X abused its procedural rights or its, its rights on the merits. So there's not even admonishment and not even a conception of um, cost uh, consequences. Um, the ICJ tends to avoid a finding of bad faith and to resolve the issue on other grounds or even to return the problem to the parties. So coming back to the Qatar Bahrain case, bad faith was made out on the evidence but not declared expressly. And the ICJ did not rule on the matter. It left it to the parties to reach an understanding. And the parties ended up agreeing that Qatar would not make reference to the documents and if the court was to adjudicate the case as if the documents were excluded. And if you go to the ICJ website today, you'll see that there are highlighted versions of Qatar's memorial and counter memorial in that case, showing which passages were no longer relied on by Qatar because, and this is the, the warning label given on the first page, because they depend solely upon documentary annexes, which Qatar has pledged itself to disregard. But there is not a word in writing, in the judgment, in an order, on what was wrong with these annexes from the court's perspective. So we see great deference shown to states and also a potential weakness in dealing with difficult case management issues. In terms of what should be done, I think the conditions for action require us to know what standards, ethical standards apply at the ICJ to parties, council, judges, court officials and maybe this is something I'll, I'll come back to later in our discussion. Well, uh, let's turn to, to a, a, a final question from me because I've seen some uh, questions coming in from our audience and I'd invite uh, the audience to continue to submit questions. Uh, but before that, we'll have a quick lightning round on problems and reform where I'll ask each of our speakers to come in with a view. International dispute settlement isn't perfect, uh, and each forum, as we've heard, has its own challenges. Each forum is also subject to criticism from outside observers, whether warranted or unwarranted. Uh, I'm going to ask each panelist to provide a one to two minute proposal to address what they perceive to be the greatest threat to the integrity of dispute resolution proceedings in their field. Uh, let, let's start with you, Melda. Uh, well, in the, in the context of the discussion on, on this panel, I, I think I would say that the, the greatest threat is from inaction and, and that there needs to be some development of a code of conduct. It's become a very diverse field in, in, in a lot of ways. Um, and so maybe uh, tactics, litigation tactics that may be acceptable in some jurisdictions, but really truly aren't um, acceptable, I think, in this context and what is what is a hybrid um, type of practice with states and private parties, um, I, I do think that there will need to be, uh, that it affects the legitimacy, and I, I've said this before, that it affects the legitimacy of, of the proceedings, and that therefore there will need to be some action, again, obviously better if the action is taken by the actors, um, uh, and obviously states are actors also, but I, and a lot of complaints about recent reform movements by states, only by states, 
Uh, so if, if we really don't want that, then I think there needs to be some kind of conscious effort to develop uh, a code of conduct for all of the, the actors in, in the proceedings. Uh, and as I say, I, I think, you know, at least in the context of recent, some, some recent, not all of them, uh, FTAs, we are starting to see um, uh, some states try to, to uh, I won't say, uh, well, some states trying to, to put, on, put pen to paper on the issues of what kind of conduct is acceptable and what is not. Uh, and as I mentioned, ICSID has done some work, but my understanding is that those are fairly, those, the code of conduct, the proposed code of conduct with Lunsitral that was developed for Lunsitral is limited to the conduct of arbitrators. And, uh, but as I say, I think it's part of the, the greater threat to the legitimacy of the proceedings. Uh, Campbell, would you like to come in on this next? Well, I completely agree with Melida that, uh, you know, this this is a, uh, a two-way street, if you like. The, the focus on the responsibilities of counsel as well as uh, on the responsibilities of, of arbitrators and judges uh, is very valuable. You know, the principle of good faith is an underlying principle and is therefore probably more powerful if you don't have to invoke it too often directly. And what I want to suggest is that we should focus more on what the, spe in the specific context where problems are arising and try and craft guidance that would be attuned to that. Um, and in, this, in the particular context of production of evidence, that's very much what the Institute of International Law tried to do uh, with the equality principles by drilling down, studying the, the actual problems that were arising uh, in the investment context in the production of evidence and the use of improper means to either obtain or suppress it, and then to give some some guidance, uh, which which is what we tried to do uh, in the in the resolution uh, on equality. Uh, and one could take a similar sort of approach. I think one doesn't you don't want to be too too prescriptive because every fact pattern is different. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we know that there are issues out there, uh, and it is much better to uh, give uh, some guidance uh, in advance rather than leaving everything to be decided in a state of nature. Thank you. Hi, um, let's turn to you next. Well, in respect of um, human rights litigation uh, before the uh, ICJ, um, the court has historically been reluctant to exercise jurisdiction over such cases, whether it's Southwest Africa in uh, 1966 or uh, Georgia versus Russia in, in 2008. Uh, the court has found ways of getting rid of cases uh, based on questionable jurisdictional grounds. And even in Bosnia versus Serbia in 1993, where the court did exercise jurisdiction, um, it defined the scope of the uh, uh, proceedings very narrowly and uh, did not play a robust role uh, in ensuring that evidence would be put uh, to the court that was crucial uh, to the uh, questions that uh, had to be determined. So I think that um, uh, the Gambia versus Myanmar will hopefully be a new chapter in the history uh, of the court. Uh, the court should be less reluctant to invoke uh, its powers to compel not just parties to produce evidence and to draw adverse inferences where they fail to, but in the context of human rights litigation, uh, there is a, another dimension which is quite important, and that is the evidence that is in the possession of United Nations uh, human rights bodies, commissions of inquiries, fact-finding missions, which uh, the United Nations Secretariat may be reluctant to uh, uh, provide to uh, parties in interstate litigation. Uh, and I think that the court in, in such circumstances has to rise to the occasion as the principal judicial organ of the United Nations, uh, ensure that its judgments are, are based uh, on the greatest possible uh, range of evidence that is available to it. Philippa, would you like to come in on this as well? Yes, so going back to the Johnny Vida quote that you cited, Emma, at the beginning, international lawyers need more than a coastal chart on the high seas. ICJ Council are not subject to any compulsory common code of conduct to guide them in navigating issues of ethics. 
disclosure, conflicts of interest, confidentiality, privilege. Those of us who are qualified in our national jurisdictions have local maps, but these don't match up with those of our co-counsel. And many counsel who are not admitted to domestic practice do appear before the court because they are senior academics or diplomats, and they have no chart guiding them at all. So agreeing with Melida, my proposal would be to develop a common code of conduct, and I think it should be endorsed by the ICJ. There are some models already, but they're often quite general, and this, of course, will take time to negotiate. But perhaps we can at least do something about good faith in disclosure, uh, as Campbell has pointed out in another context. And maybe we could draw inspiration from the Institute's work on this. And I would commend the proposal of Kate Pilot and Amy Sander that they made in Age of Unbound to have a new practice direction setting out a duty on council not to mislead the ICJ and a duty on states to disclose relevant and material documents. Uh, perhaps not surprising uh, that, that a group of lawyers sees more rules as being the answer here. <laughs> <laughs> Let, let's turn, we've had, we've had a number of questions coming in, um, so in the time available to us, let's tackle some of them. And I see that there's been uh, quite a lot of interest in, in the issue of technology and virtual or remote proceedings um, in the context of, of COVID-19 in particular. So let, let me uh, direct uh, this to, to perhaps uh, Philippa and Payam, if, I, if either wishes to come in on this. The question is, in light of COVID-19 imperatives to use, to, to use virtual meetings and hearings, should international courts consider adding technology in their statutes? We know there's been a, a recent update to the ICJ's rules of procedure, um, but would it be useful to perhaps see more specificity? Maybe I can just quickly say, uh, uh, no, I think that the rule that was adopted just recently, as you pointed out, Emma, is, is adequate. There are some interesting issues regarding the obligation of the court to sit in The Hague. And I should point out that a quorum of judges will be sitting physically in The Hague uh, on Tuesday, June 30. Um, so um, if... Um, uh, uh, the court were to dispense with that requirement, then yes, it, it would require an amendment of its statute. But I'm satisfied that the uh, recently adopted rule addresses the issue appropriately. Yes, I, I think it's a good start. And, you know, maybe COVID-19 has, has made all of us catch up to where things were going anyway. Um, but you know, just adopting this rule as a good start is not enough. Um, obviously, there's a whole architecture that's going to have to be built around that, including training, um, technology, security, um, and, you know, rules about recording, um, and also rules about communications uh, within and between councils. So this is, this is a good start, but there's quite a way to go. Thank you. Let's... Uh... Let's take a, uh, a another COVID-related question that goes to uh, the, the investor state context. Um, investors suing states for measures taken to address the coronavirus, could that constitute a violation of the duty to litigate in good faith? And, and I, I suppose here the implication is that there's been some kind of opportunistic bringing of the claim uh, during the crisis as opposed to, to the substance of the claim relating to measures uh, in light of, in light, taken in light of COVID. Uh, Melida or Campbell, if either of you has a, a comment on that, perhaps? Well, I'll, I'll just say that as an automatic matter, no, I don't think so. Um, obviously, you know, states have to take measures that they think are necessary, but the behavior of states within that context, and states I think agree with this, would be governed by whatever the treaty and, and larger customary international law provisions might, that might be applicable. So automatically bringing claim, I, I, I say this and fully aware that there are calls by some very prominent um, uh, professors to uh, have parties agree not to bring claims 
uh, based on COVID or during COVID. Uh, however, there is no agreement on that. I don't know that states themselves have pushed for that. So uh, not, not ignoring that there is a debate out there as to whether or not these should be brought. I, I would not say that the very fact of bringing them, obviously regulations have to, any kind of regulation uh, has to, or measure has to be applied uh, fairly and non-discriminatory. So I, I don't think automatically that it's a, it's an issue. Campbell, did you like to comment on that one? Well, uh, obviously, and I'm sure the questioner wouldn't expect me to express a view on the substantive issue of the effect of uh, uh, the introduction of public health regulations on any investment claim. Uh, for myself, I don't see this as a question of um, uh, some kind of general blanket uh, inhibition on the bringing of claims, but nevertheless, I think tribunals, certainly once constituted, need to be sensitive, and we are seeking to be sensitive right at the moment, to the effect which the current crisis is imposing simply on uh, the party's ability to litigate effectively. We have to be sure that they can litigate effectively in order to uh, uh, be able to proceed. And uh, so considerable understanding from tribunals is needed in, in the regulation of the timetable. Um, mindful of time, uh, I, I think we will probably need to, to draw things to a close there. Uh, and and I think what what has perhaps come out of this very interesting and very informative discussion on a number of different areas of international dispute settlement um, is that claim, claims of bad faith in proceedings are quite frequently made, perhaps more frequently than they should be, um, but that courts and tribunals are unwilling to engage with them and will find a way not to if, if they possibly can. Um, and that what, what might be required in the context of, of regulating international practitioners is more soft law. So there's a call uh, to the international dispute settlement community there to perhaps in addition to uh, regulating or attempting to regulate arbitrators' behavior, perhaps we counsel need the same treatment. Um, so with that, uh, it remains for me to thank our panelists for this spirited discussion, our audience for their participation, and Azel for convening the meeting. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.